First, this particular site, you hadn't told them anything at all about the site. This particular site, we here at Colony Wingsburg have been building <coughs> since 2003, literally, from the ground up. This was a parking lot. Wow. So we had to really kind of start from scratch and clear out trees that weren't trees of the period, use the tools and techniques of the time, which meant, you know, you can see why it's been a real long work in progress. Down at the bottom, we constructed the slave house first here on the property, and the um, tobacco house followed suit. The first building closest to us here with the chimney attached had already been constructed about 20 years ago over in the restoration, and it had been constructed using the same tools and techniques. We took out um, and left up about three quarters of that building that had been used kind of like a little duplex in town and turned it into the kitchen for the owner and his family, which I'm going to tell you about in just a moment. <laughs> The middle building there is the smokehouse, and that is a working smokehouse. All these buildings get put to use except for one and to do it only, and that's the slave house. Okay? All right, but all the other buildings are storage buildings here on the property, and we grow the crops, we butcher. In fact, you just didn't miss it. <laughs> just another three weeks, and we'll be butchering here on the property. Yeah. Have you ever seen that done? I don't mean slaughtering. Just the butchering part. No, I've seen it all. It's gross. Yeah. 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 And that's <laughs> good for people to see, though, um, so they know the different parts of the meat. So we've got real meats hanging up there inside of that smokehouse. Some of them are three years old, some of them are two years old, and then some have been in the last year. And once more towards the front, you'll see um, when you look around are the newest ones. The first building there that you came past is our corn house. And we're going to talk about that corn and the main staple for most people's diets when we go down to the slave house and then like I said we got the tobacco house here. The tobacco house is pretty interesting because when we built the tobacco house just to show you what times could have been like in the colonial period, the storm Ernesto came through here and two of our carpenters had just completed their journeyman papers. Mm -hmm. and they completed their journeyman papers on that route they had to do the move all over again. Oh. <laughs> so can you Imagine how unhappy they probably yeah. were. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, just as out here in this field right here, Hurricane Irene came in and took out our corn. So we had to harvest the corn early here, and you'll see that stored inside of the corn house. The cotton is what we have in the fields right now. The only crop we have out in the fields, we're getting the fields ready now for the upcoming year. And what little tobacco we did harvest is drying out there inside of the tobacco house. We also grow wheat, oats, flax, a little bit of barley, just to give people an idea of those crops. Nothing on a large scale. We only have two farmers who work out here. But one of the main reasons that we built this site was to show people how about 70 to 80 percent of Virginians' population would have been living. Free, black, white, enslaved. So you can really see life for that time. Not taking anything away from what we have over there in the restoration, but more common life that people could relate to. You know, I, I tell people all the time when you come to the slave house, you're not just walking in the slave house. If you're not related to any of those really, really rich guys, whether you were left out of the will or not, you're going to be welcomed home down there to that slave house because that's everyday life. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, mm -hmm. everyday life. And it's something people really do have to see because it's not the image that we get from the movies in the history books. You know, we think of that Gone with the Wind concept and plantation is huge with a manor house and hundreds of slaves. First off, ain't nobody going to have hundreds of slaves on one property. What's going to be the problem? Keep them and feed them. Rebellions and insurrections. Come on, y'all. You better think real. You're going to have all kinds of problems happening. If you just have one, one owner and maybe one overseer, and you got a couple of hundred people, you're a little outnumbered. So you're not going to find the average plantation um, for even the rich guys to have any more than 40 to 50. These guys would do good. I'm talking per plantation, for field hands, okay? These guys as middle class would do good if they had one to two, two to three tops, 10 to 15 per plantation. Wow. Because you've got to look at wages. <coughs> and a middle class guy will talk about, and we've researched about 20 different families who are of the middle class. Remember the writings aren't going to be the same as the rich who have the means and the money to sit down and keep a diary and a journal of their day to day lives. But a middle class guy talks about earning, by the time of the revolution, about 60 to 70 pounds British sterling money. 
off that cash crop tobacco. I'm going to show you when we go down to the slave house the values of many of these slaves that you could see it could sometimes take one to two to three years wages to get one. How many acres are typical? 150. I was getting ready to go to your next. That's all. You jumped in my head. I appreciate that. 150 to 250 acres. You've done pretty good by 18th century standards. You can find a little more for some who maybe consider the upper middle class. And that upper middle class may have that more of 10 to 15 to, no, I mean, I said that wrong, 10 to 12, upwards of 15. Um, what I'd like people to think about is this. I give a real simple analogy. If you are an average person today, okay, and you're not a good manager of money, and you live from paycheck to paycheck, that doesn't mean you're not a good manager of money because you live from paycheck to paycheck. I understand times, but if you live from paycheck to paycheck, and you go and you play the lottery, and you hit the lottery, <coughs> and you don't get somebody to assist you with that money, mm -hmm. you might find yourself in a bigger mess mm -hmm. than what you were in before you hit that lottery. Mm -hmm. Same is true in this business of slavery. If you can't manage a small bit, don't go get a large bit. Because you still have taxes that you have to pay. And you have taxes you have to pay on those people. Right. So you'll see many reasons why the numbers will be low, but you also have to consider an easy way to get them, and you have to manage that too. And you know what the easiest way is to get them if you can't afford to buy them outright? Let them, them reproduce. Right. You know what they call it? No. Breeding. And breeding is a very common concept by this time of the revolution. In fact, um, Mr. Jefferson writes in his farmer's handbook and says that he would rather breed fine women than to have men making money off the cash crop tobacco and said he made plenty of money doing it. Oh, breeding fine women. And not he himself. No, no, I know. But, okay, <laughs> the, the thing well. is, is you're talking about people who are selling children. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, you know, I just give you Jefferson because people know that name, yeah. okay? There's mm -hmm. lots of guys who were clearly saying greeting was fine because they define them, remember, not as people, but property, mm -hmm. and we're specifically child property, yes. No, was it more common, like we learned at Mount Vernon that Washington... <laughs> encouraged his slaves to have families? Every owner is going to be different. I'm going to talk yeah. about that. Because, you know, I like people to look at it from a, a bigger picture. Is that how they looked at breeding, though? Or was breeding, like, forcibly saying you will have children? Or? Some owners will say they expect you to have one after the first every year or every other year after that. Um, I don't go and say this is one and all are thinking okay. that way. We have to be very general yeah. when you look at the system okay. because every person is different. People today are different. So when you look at what some owners may say, I mean, Jefferson, I'm sorry, Washington also talks about taking good care of his Negroes, giving them one blanket per winter. Is that good care? <laughs> you know, so what is he defining as good to someone who says they feed their slaves well? What is their definition of well and good? And, you know, you've got to really read into it, and that's why I tell people to look at the bigger picture and think out of the box and see things from all sides, not just from the owner's sides, not just from those who are free people in general in society, but a lot of the slaves, we have to really dig deep to see, well, what is their take on this? Does somebody write it down in their diary? Or well, hopefully we can find somebody else who says, Oh, I'm a journalist who travels through Virginia, and this is what I see when I go from plantation to plantation. And I depend upon people like Philip Vickers Fithian. And Philip Vickers Fithian, who also was a tutor and a missionary, he really talks a lot about what he's seeing overseers doing and how related. Yes, he's a traveler, and he's coming from New Jersey, and he's going through the Chesapeake. And this man really gives you what I say is a lot of the meat that you can get all sides of the story. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to read some of those primary sources okay. to you. I'm talking a lot, so I need to take them down to the slave house. Um, before we go down to the slave house, I want you to do something when we go into that house, please, if you would, for me. And I appreciate your nods, because um, nods are really, really important to me in doing this job. I'll tell anybody, I've been doing this a long time. This is not an easy job. I'm working here now, coming up on 31 years. Mm -hmm. And you come as modern day people. And I respect that. But you got to really think out of the box and be grounded 
when you come into that slave house and prepare yourself. I'm going to get you real grounded. Okay? First, you all know you're born into this in the colonial times. 1662, the law in Virginia says condition the child is based on the status of the mother. So mother's a slave, child's automatically a slave. Not, may not have time to talk a lot about many of these owners who are fathering a lot of these children, but clearly you can see why the status will be based on the condition of the mother and not that of the father. Something else to think about, and having said owners are fathering a lot of these children, many of these men will own their own children as slaves. Okay? 1667, Virginia will write a law that says, as a slave, baptism will not alter your condition in society. So legally, we know they're not being recognized as Christians. By 1669, Virginia has a law, and I give you these first three, four reasons. Again, I want you to be grounded. 1669, this puts it into perspective. If you kill your slave in the line of correction, and it is defined as an accident, it is not a crime. If you kill your slaves in the line, line of correction, correction. We're going to talk about that correction when we go down to the slave house. It is not a crime. Is this a business? Mm -hmm. Is this a business? Yeah. This is a business that's solely based around the economy. And we're going to go and we're going to see what life might have been like for those people in this business of slavery. So we're going to go down to the slave house. Only we will be in there because I'm going to try and make it as real for you as possible. And others may not be grounded if they want to join us. I always say when people come to Colonial Williamsburg, they expect to hear about Washington, Jefferson, and Henry. Then they meet me. <laughs> okay, so let's go. Were slaves considered people? No. 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 Legally, as I've already stated, they're property. Some will say chattel, cattle. Others will say real estate. Either way, please remember they're transferable, sellable, wedding presents, birthday presents, Christmas presents, people left them in their wills to their loved ones, and they even had lotteries. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest prizes you could win in the lottery was land, stocks, and slaves. Could they legally marry, sanctioned by the church or the courts, if they were property? No. no. They legally were not recognized as Christians, as I've already told you. Could they even name their children if they wanted to? No something to think about. That's the owner's right. That's his property. So they will give them biblical names. They will give them names of Greek gods and goddesses, stars and planets, names of cities in Europe. Excuse me a minute. <laughs> names of cities in Europe so that many will say, identify with my life not African life. They say it will make them become human. Mm. Remember they were called heathens, creatures, savages. Some will call them their fictive kin, fictional family members. They may be the ones who they take their children and give them as gifts to their loved ones. Just for one moment, I'd like you to imagine everything that I just said haven't happened to you. Okay, there's a um, thing on that door there that needs to be pushed over. If you'd open it for me, please. Slide it across. Okay, y'all want to move back so you're a little bit more comfortable? Where you going? <laughs> <laughs> Where you going? Where you at? Can you hand me that whip off the wall, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, how y'all feeling? A little scared. Sad. <laughs> 
first. I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about what I've just said to you. Why are you scared? No, I'd be scared because, especially if I was a child, mm -hmm. I would You have children? Be, yes, you I do. have children? I would be really unsure as to what my future would be. I could be taken away from my mother, my, you know, the situation that I would be in, and who knows what, what I could be doing or where I could go. Okay. What if you're that mother? Is that thought always in the back of your mind? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about this for a moment. There's a cart on the other side of the property. And there's a man coming today to get some goods. Who has little ones? Raise your hands. How old is your littlest? Six months old. Oldest? Five and a half. Need him to help. He, she? She. Need him to help load that cart. Come up here with me a minute. Stand right by the door, please. Who else has little ones? How old? Two and six. Six-year-old. Little girl. Stand here. One more. How old? Twelve and fourteen. I'll take your twelve-year-old. Come with me. Over here. Stand right there, if you would, please. On this day, the man that is coming to load the cart, the owner is not going to tell you who he is. There is an overseer and or foreman on the property, and I'll make them clear to you who they are in just a moment, who will assist those young ones and some of the adults to go and load that cart. Don't worry. He'll tell you they'll be back. Nighttime will come. Six-year-old. How old did you say? Six. Six. You said five. Yeah. Five, six, and twelve. Don't come back. Next morning, worst nightmare has come true. You don't know who that man was. You don't know if he's next door five miles down the road. You don't know if he's 20 miles down the road. You don't even know if he's in another college that's come to get those goods, because those goods that he came to get were people. So I want you to tell me just how you think you're going to get up the next morning and go out there and work in those fields another 12, 14-hour day. Because ain't nobody going to say, oh, sit and grieve. It's all right, I understand. And they got a little reminder here to let you know, if you don't think you understand. They're going to come here to this door if you don't move fast enough and say, Get up! Get out there now! Because they will say the Negroes do not know how to love. They have no feelings. They'll have another, or they'll find another. So how might you, if this was you, Heal your soul. No ways. Think you might do it through one another? Yeah, I'd be pretty angry if I was the father of those kids. You feel like you're supposed to be the protector of them and you have no control whatsoever of their care. What might you do? I f like my first instinct is to kill that person. Remember what I told you now. <clears throat> if they correct you and you die, it's not a crime. It's not worth living. <laughs> I was going to say kill myself. I know. What's the point? Don't think people didn't do it. Suicide, melancholy, state of depression. I want you to see the good in it. Watch this. Tell me that doll, if you would, please, ma'am, right there, the corn husk doll. And I really want you to see this. Because one thing I always try and emphasize to children especially. As sad as this may sound, these people were strong. Mm. Strong mentally and physically to make it in a system where somebody didn't recognize you as human. So, who had the little girl? Imagine she made a doll just like this. And she played with it. 
when she was real, real small, because they put them out in the fields at four and five. Five and six, they weeding around that tobacco, plucking those worms off those tobacco leaves. Nine and ten, depending on size, maybe working right alongside adults. Sixteen, you are an adult. So when she was little, she had some time to play with that doll, and you gonna hold on to that doll. Because see, we got little holes in here. There's one up under the bed, and there's one right over there. We call them little treasure chests. And we find these kinds of things through excavation that gives you hope. Lift your spirits up. Keep you going. Maybe you never get your freedom. Maybe she'll get her freedom. You want to really get that owner a good piece of your mind? You think about seeing her one more time. You go through day by day by day, becoming stronger and stronger. You do it through family. You do it through God. Many people find different ways to heal themselves. You may do it through those Africans. I'm going to show you how you're going to do it through those Africans. Y'all hold on. I ain't done with you yet. Thank you. Place that back there for me. See that bed over there in the corner? I call it a Queen Anne bed. Everybody knows about Queen Anne furniture. Yes? Mm -hmm. the colonial period. Yeah. Naming their furniture after people back there in England. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you why I call it a Queen Anne bed. Many of these Africans who came here, they knew about that life of royalty in Africa. Kings and queens, princesses and princes, they could sit you down and tell you if they never were a part of it, what they saw and how proud they are of their people, and how they made it through that voyage and traveling across the Atlantic Ocean. And by this time of the revolution, we're not talking about a lot of Africans because of that natural increase of population. But if you've got a first-generation African on that property, or even a second generation who learned from that first-generation African, they sit you down and they tell you about just how strong they were and how strong we can become and how you can really make it in this life. You tell me that's not something to be proud of mm -hmm. and keep going and get out there regardless of what that person may have to say about you. And do you have a wife? Yes. You think you were going to stand up to the master after what he did to your child? Watch what he could do to your wife. No children out there? None. You think he's going to come in here and tell you he's going to sleep with her? No. Get out! When you come back, you still better love her. Because you all she got. I know you really want him now. You'd like to take him out, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Could these men really stand up if they wanted to for themselves? Sure, well, go ahead and stand up if you want. See if your life won't be on the line. How strong did they have to be? How strong did that mother have to be when they took that child from you? How strong did that child have to become in this life? I'm going to tell you why I'm not talking a lot about stuff in here. Because I, I, I hope that you're grounded enough. This will not help you to see slavery. When people walk into this house, I say, it's nice to see this stuff. But it's just that. It's stuff. It's how many people would have lived in the 18th century. Free, black, white. This could have been the owner's house to start with with his slaves. He may start out with one or two, two or three, share it with them. This is where 10 to 12 people as enslaved individuals could be placed in. This doesn't define life for these people. Material things are great to see when you go into Williamsburg. They hold a lot of monetary value. These things will hold a lot of sentimental value, which could be just as important to these people to make it in this life. Learn how to survive and dry things out in the African way. Learn how to store things up underground in these root cellars because this is the basic ration that owners will provide for their slaves. Many will write and say a peck of corn. That's what this would equal to by the week for each adult. Please, you're welcome to feel this corn and pass this bucket around if you'd like. This is not that sweet white yellow corn that we know. It's called a gourd seed corn. Is she all right? Yes. Okay. Here, I got a cough drop. 
Here you go. a week for each adult, half of that for children. Take it and grind it up here in this mortar and pestle. Make it into a cornmeal. By the time you grind that up, you might got half of this bucket. That means hardly nothing for the children. And in addition, many will say in a pound of salted meat. By the week! <coughs> and that may be salted fish or pork. Sound like a lot? You better learn quick how to live off the land. So you hope that they give you a plot of land for vegetables, as you'll see out here. You hope they give you a plot of land for chickens. Get the eggs from the chickens. Supplement that diet. Now, all around you, you have squirrel, possum, muskrat, raccoon, rabbit. Am I naming large game or small game? Small. What does it take to kill large game? God bless you. Musk. That would be a smart thing to put in the hands of people. But think about this. They allowed their slaves to cook for them, but they didn't want them to have weapons. <laughs> yeah, that's something to laugh at. So they have what they call tasters. Yeah. Absolutely. You to cook, your wife will be the taster. She to cook, you'll be the taster. They may sit right before you and watch to make sure nothing that's going in their food. But you try and take them out. I say you didn't have to, though. Passive resist. Sold off your child. Sold off your child. Shh. There's herbs and things you can put in their food, have them on chamber pots for days on end. Mm -hmm. Let me remind you of what you did to me and mine. You don't have to kill somebody. Get out there in those fields and slow down everybody. Somebody might get the lash. But you had to learn to work smart, not hard. If you work too hard, you're going to die. So you really had to use this to survive. We are also on the peninsula. And being on the peninsula, we're surrounded by water. So you've got the riverbeds around here that are brackish. You can get plenty of shellfish from the riverbeds. How much time do you think these people had to do these things I just said? So when the sun went down, you might have to come back and tend to that garden. Make sure those traps have been checked. Or the young ones who were left behind, the older ones, have them go out there and check things. You walking, you learn how to work. You don't learn how to work, you're not needed very long on a property like this. You learn too much, you have a great deal of value. Great deal of value could very well mean save. Could mean tax time, can't pay it, sell off one of the Negroes. I'm going to take you outside in just a minute. Where's Ellen? <coughs> How am I for time? You're good. Okay. I'm going to take, take you outside, and I want to give you an idea of the values of some of these people. But before we go outside, um, I really want you to know, and to tell your young people today, these people were ingenious. I'm proud of these people, if it doesn't come across. I wouldn't trade what I do for anything. I'm only two generations removed from the institution of slavery. Two. I got longevity in my family, do I? Not Bill. Yes, I do. My mother's father was 98, and father's father was 101. Both their parents were born slaves here. So, tell your young people today, I'll save it. I'll tell you when we get outside. Upstairs, so you know, is storage. Remember, root cellar, treasure chest. Look here. See if you have any questions when we go outside. We're going to look at the values of these people. And then I have just a few more things I want to say to you. So, didn't mean you had to be mean to them. But you still were owning somebody as property. All right, I have two lotteries I want to pass around to you. They're both the same. I'll start. I apologize. I don't know. It's nothing. It's some food I think <laughs> I wasted on here. Um, you can pass it around, and then I'm gonna, another one I'm going to send to the other side. So everybody has a chance to really see it. 
On yours, you'll see that I have highlighted in this lottery some people. So y'all kind of gather over here as a group. So everybody can see it. Make sure everybody can see this one. You'll see their values are there. Let me step over here some so I'm not talking over him. Let's step over by this big tree here. Excuse me. Just diving on your back. Rest stop, too. <laughs> we just put that up yesterday. Y'all know what that is, right? That mud up in between there? Mostly manure. 75%. We mixed it up out here yesterday and put it uh, filled in open holes there. Straw, grass, whatever is mixed in with it, because you know that's a good recycled product. Mm -hmm. Makes it into like a concrete. Mm -hmm. Is that okra going? Yep, exactly right. <laughs> Everything you see over here in this garden may be a little different than what up, what's up the hill in the master's garden. More African foods in this garden. Okay, does everybody have access? You got your little group so everybody can see this lottery? Okay, values will be based on age and skill. Remember that's all pounds British sterling. So those who are lesser in value will be young children and or older slaves. Remember older slaves values will pretty much level off 10 pounds British sterling. Young children their values will increase as their skills increase. You all who have this front lottery closest to me, same as theirs, but I didn't highlight theirs it's the way I did yours. Tell me who the first one is highlighted on there. Call it out, somebody. Robin. Negro man, Robin. Good Read boy. what it says so they can find it there. A Negro man, Robin, a good lawyer. Sawyer. 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 I was going to say. Wow. <laughs> Sawyer and Bella, his wife. Okay, what's the next line say? A Negro girl named Suki, about 12 years old, and another named Betty, about 7 years old, children of Robin and Bella. Okay. Are they together? No. No. So that meant if you got that lottery ticket that you purchased for 10 pounds British sterling money, as it says there, stop for a moment. Somebody read to me who the managers are at the bottom of this lottery. George Washington. John Randolph. John Baylor. Lewis. Speak a little louder so everybody can hear you. Oh, uh, Archibald Carey, Carter Braxton, Benjamin Harrison. John Madison, Richard Henry Lee, Richard Henry Lee. These names ring a bell to you all? Oh, yeah. These men are managing this lottery for Bernard Moore, who's in some debt. They may even throw in some of their property and make a profit off of this lottery. Ten pounds British sterling money for the tickets. One thousand seven hundred and some. What's the number? 1,800 total tickets available. It's at the very bottom. 1,840 tickets. And 1,700 what? Blanks. That means you got that chance at winning the lottery for these prizes that are there. You see the ages of these children? You see many families that are separated? Yes. Read to me what yours says that's highlighted in green, please, ma'am. A fine breeding woman named Pat, uh, lame of one side with child and with child and her three children. Um, I can't read it. That's all right. They're, they're, she's got Millie three children. Three, yes. Thing we need to know is she's got three children and she's and one on the way. Wow. Think about this. Her value is 110 pounds British sterling. You hit that lottery and you win her on that 10 pound lottery ticket, you could turn around and make money hand over foot <coughs> off of the four that are already there and the one to come. Don't think people didn't do it, because they did. Could you explain this whole lottery system? I'm not, I'm it gets a little complicated, so yeah. I will make it simple for you. Yeah. This right. man is in debt, okay? Bernard Moore, the bottom of the paper. Right. Yeah. He is selling off land, stock, and slaves so that he can get out of his debt. Right. It's plain and simple. This all his stuff. So you purchase mm -hmm. tickets. And these lotteries, don't just think we're talking about these people who are involved in these lotteries. Churches get involved in these lotteries too. 
Remember the Church of England. Church of England is involved in this business of slavery. Watch me. I'm going to give you a, a one example to think about. Virginia writes a law, as I said, in 1662 that says you're born into society based on the condition of your mother, right? How can you even get a free black population to come out of that if you're looking at the majority of the people who are Negro to be enslaved? White women taken up with African men. We know what's happening, or they would have never written this law. 1690 prohibits cohabitation in marriage between Negroes and Christians. Well, we know they ain't talking about Negroes, right? They said Negroes and Christians, so clearly they're talking about Negro and white. Yeah. That law stays on the books, tell anybody now back there in the back. Y'all know what the date was? Bill, you know what the date was? 1967 is my family to change that law. My dad's first cousin, Mildred Jeter, married Richard Lovin in 58. Took them from 58 to 1967 to get it passed by the Supreme Court. They could be husband and wife legally in the state of Virginia. Here's one of the reasons I believe they write this, to prevent, again, there being a free black population coming into existence. So they will later say, if you are a Christian woman and you take up with a Negro man, you can be publicly whipped upwards of 20 times across your bare back and could pay a fine of five to 10 pounds British sterling money for having had a bastard child, that mulatto. I want you to watch me on this. I'm bringing the church into it. I'm also going to tell you what owners say about themselves as they father many of these children. I don't think this one was working too well. I don't know if the women weren't paying the fine or what, but by 1723, they put two laws on the books, and here's what one of them states. If you're a Christian wo woman and you take up with a Negro man and you conceive that bastard child, is pretty much what it's spelling out, they will take that child from you. And they will give that child to the church. The church of England can bound that child out to someone it says for 31 years. And then, if you live after 31 years, you could get your freedom. 31 years could be your life in that time. Presumably the church made money off that deal? Oh, yes, yeah. ma'am. And not only that, you think about this. What woman wants to knowingly have their child taken from them? So here's what... what you know, the other part of that story is, is this is clearly a deterrent to prevent there being a free black population. In 1723, when that law went on the books, you also see they write a law about how you can free your slaves now. And they say manumission can only be done through what they call meritorious services, saving your master's life or reporting an insurrection. There are a lot of rebellions that were starting to occur around that time. So they're doing everything they can to make sure they keep these people in line and again a lot of these rebellions are being led by the small bit of free black population so control them by making the laws even harder in how people could get their freedom here's what they say about white men i find this one interesting i don't even think it should have been wrote down on paper but here's what it says i'm sorry i'm not supposed to give my personal opinion but i, I really do find this interesting it says, if you are a Christian man and you take up with a Negro woman, please go before the church and can ask for forgiveness. Because remember, that's more money in their pockets. Who writes these things? Government. Who's the government? Who own the bulk of the land and the bulk of the slaves. All right, here's the, here's the final part of what I want to share with you. I told you in the house there's something I want you to really tell your children. I don't care what race they may be, because slavery has affected all races of peace at some point in history. It didn't have to be here in the United States. It was happening throughout the world. It doesn't make it right, but it clearly was a system that was in place. Tell them, be proud of these people. We don't have to be proud of the system, but we need to be proud of the people. I tell people never to be ashamed 
to know that they are in any way connected to a lesser class of folk. Because those lesser class of folks were the ones who built this country, for this country to be what it is today. Those men didn't have the time to tend to the land. They had the money. They had the money through the people. Whether it was the value, whether it was the labor, and they made plenty of money off of this system of slavery. I also want you to share with them, and somebody can write it down if they like, a proverb that I wrote about 20 years ago. And I wrote this about the time, actually it was not even 20 years ago, it was when the Columbine incident happened. And I had the privilege of working with some of their, in fact their class was here, some of the students were right here who were going to that school the very next year at a plantation that we used to own called Carter's Grove. And it was really interesting that I got to work with them because they didn't know yet when they were here that the incident had occurred. But I shared this proverb with them that I wrote from that story. And it says, it is better to fight within, to live, to fight again, than to fight out and lie dead and do nothing. Teach your young people, fight with your minds, not with your fist. And they can go far in life. Okay? Okay. All right. I'm all done with you all, unless you have questions. I thank you very much for your time this thank morning. You. Thank, thank you. you.